Well, hey, what's up, IO? So good to see you guys on a Sunday night. Uh, I'm so excited that you decided to be here as we kick off a brand new series uh, in 1 John. Uh, later on, I'm going to kind of talk to you and give you a challenge for this series, uh, something that you can be doing uh, together with your small group as you kind of navigate this book of the Bible uh, with us for the month of February. Hey, I'm glad you decided to be here tonight. I'm glad that, uh, that you're not only here but that you're joining us on a night where I feel like God is doing something pretty cool. Uh, so uh, just to kind of like give you guys a, a precursor to, to my talk, um, I had the opportunity this weekend to hang out with Transit at Transit Weekend. Yeah, it was an awesome time. Thank you, all of you guys that were there at Transit Weekend. Thank you for giving up your weekend there. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, but we, had the, we talked about this, I, this idea uh, of pressure there and how nobody should navigate that alone in your middle school years. Uh, and then this morning, uh, I was sitting in Adam, our lead pastor here at Brownsbridge, his message down the hall in the auditorium. And uh, I found myself just hearing some of the stuff that he was saying. And I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds like some of the stuff I'm going to say tonight at Inside Out. And so I feel like, and I'll touch on that more in a minute, I feel like God has something very specific uh, that he's trying to tell Brownsbridge Church this weekend. There's so many things from Transit Weekend to the, the adult service this morning and Adam's message to tonight that I feel like just overlaps. I feel like God has something very cool and very special for us here tonight. So thank you for being here, and I hope that uh, God does something fresh and new in your heart tonight. Uh, as I was kicking off this series uh, and, and listening to Adam's talk this morning, he challenged us as a church to be real. That was his, his thing. Like, if first you don't succeed, find someone and be real. And I started thinking about be real like the app, right, the, the app be real, and uh, how it's kind of, I don't know, taken off in the last year or so. And uh, the, the app has created some very interesting moments because they, they build themselves, they, 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 they you know, kind of advertise themselves as life unscripted, right? Unfiltered and unscripted is kind of how they, they advertise is that you can take these photos and you don't know when it's going to go off and you can't plan ahead of time. You just kind of like capture whatever you're doing in the moment. And what it does is it creates some pretty like awkward or funny, you know, moments uh, because you, you can't really plan ahead. It's just like, hey, this is what's happening. And so, uh, you know, I did a quick Google search to find some, uh, you know, what are some of the funniest things that people have captured on Be Real. Uh, not funny, it's just like unique is maybe a better word. And so uh, I found something I'm going to share with you guys. The first one is this guy who clearly uh, was messed up playing on his phone and gets uh, in a car wreck. And he decided like, yeah, now would be a good time to be real because uh, he's got a, a busted lip and he's given a thumbs up. So everything's okay, clearly. Uh, looking at his windshield here, I wonder if he hit something or somebody. I don't know. Let's hope it wasn't like a, somebody on a bike or something. That'd have been terrible. Uh, but clearly, you know, he's being very real and maybe he should not drive his phone in his hand. I don't know. Maybe that was part of the problem. I, I don't know. So if you drive, put the phone away, arrive alive. All right. So uh, that, that's an interesting one. Uh, the next one is kind of a take on that. Uh, very interesting. Uh, the caption killed me. That's why I included it. Because the caption says, I don't know if you can read it, watching Raquel get arrested. I saw that and I was like, man, that is a real friend. Like your friend is getting cuffed on the back of, or on the front of a cop car. You're like, wait, 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 wait. Be real just went off. <laughs> like, and she's not even like, I mean, she's fake concerned. You know, they're like, oh my gosh. Like this isn't like actual concern. This is, this is fake. Uh, so, you know. She's being a little too real. If that's your friend, if your friend's getting arrested, you know, maybe call their parents or a lawyer or something. Don't, don't put it on be real because uh, somebody like me is going to use it in a, in a message. But it's not just like, I mean, I, I found those, I thought those were kind of funny or unique. You know, you don't see those a lot. But it's not just like us common folk that get in on it, right? Even celebrities have gotten in on the bid. I, I found this one of none other than Harry Styles himself uh, was at a concert of his and be real went off and he takes a photo and clearly he's struggling, right? Like he doesn't know how it worked. Maybe he didn't realize that it was going to get both sides of the, the camera. I, I don't know. But uh, even, you know, I didn't know Harry Styles could take a bad picture, but if he could, it would, this would be probably as close as it gets to Harry Styles taking a bad picture. But I got to be honest, I saw this and I had a lot of sympathy uh, for Mr. Styles here because uh, I, so y'all probably know, how old is Harry Styles? 29. 29. <laughs> I didn't even get the question. I was like, 29 uh, in range, right? So and Harry Styles uh, is not quite as old as I am. Uh, but when Be Real like, came out, I didn't know what to do with it. Like, I'm getting old. I don't just know technology like you guys do. And there's a, a group of you that caught me slipping one night over here. Uh, and they 
asked me to take a photo of them, and it was a B-reel, and I didn't know how it worked. And it produced this gem. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right? Thanks, Sarah Beth, for that. I reached out to her. I was like, hey, do you still have that super embarrassing picture of me? She's like, boy, do I. Uh, so couldn't wait to participate in that uh, when I was learning how Be Real works. All right, you can take that off. We don't want to see that. The whole idea is it captures you in the real <laughs> moments, right? It captures you as you are, as it's happening. And that's the best, the best part of Be Real is it, it challenges you to just like, hey, this is just the way things are, right? You can't dress up, you can't fix your hair, you, you know, you can't fix your bloody lip if you've been in a wreck, you can't unarrest your friend. Like, it just is what it is in the moment, you know? Harry Styles can't go back and retouch up and have his eyes open, you know, I can't learn technology in time. Like, it just, it just is what it is, right? And I think it's so great and it's such a cool take on social media because we, we see it the opposite way so often. It's filtered, it's scripted, it's posed, it's planned. And you can tell, right? You can tell the difference between what you see on like an app like Instagram or, or on Snapchat with all the filters versus like on Be Real where it's like, hey, it's just what's happening in the moment. But I started thinking about that and, and when it gets into other areas of our life that aren't on our phones or on social media, this kind of gets a little bit more complicated. It gets a little bit more difficult to just be honest and real and vulnerable. Like maybe you can relate to this. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, I guess it was 2021. So yeah, that's a couple years ago now. We're in 2023. It's a new year. Uh, a couple years ago in 2021, I'm just going to be honest with you guys. I was having a rough go. And this isn't like, this is the fun, you know, this isn't me making light of. Like, I was having a tough year. It was, it was bad on, on many fronts. Uh, in January of that year, I kicked off the year by one of my longest friends. We were in the same first grade class, graduated high school together. You know, just somebody I'd done life with for years and years and years died unexpectedly in his sleep. And so, yeah, I mean, it was horrifying. And we were just like, oh my gosh, how does this happen? Uh, later in the year, uh, you know, I, I, I found out that, um, you know, another former student of mine, a student that used to sit in a room just like this and, and listen to me blabber on about apps I didn't understand, just like you guys do. Uh, he was off at college and the weight of things that he was dealing with got so much for him that he took his life one night in college. Nobody had any idea that he was struggling. And it was just over, just like that. And, you know, I'm carrying this stuff around and, I, you know, I get paid by Inside Out to come up here and act like everything's fine. And let me tell you guys some funny jokes. And, you know, I would mingle with people afterwards while we're all eating chicken nuggets later, you know, and people would be like, Heath, how's things going? And have you ever been in that situation when the honest answer to how things going is they are really bad? I'm having a very difficult time. But that's not what we say, right? We say, I'm good. How are you? It's fine. I'm making it. You know, like we have these things where we're just kind of like, ah, I'm not really going to answer your question. And then you flip it back on them and they do the same. And you're like, well, see you again next week. We'll do this again. And it's this awkward moment. But what I learned in that time is because this was like, this wasn't like a week for me. This wasn't like a couple months. Like the whole year for 2021 was just tough on me. At one point in time, uh, Aaron and I found out we were pregnant, which is fantastic. And we have a little boy now. But at the time we were like, oh my gosh, like, we need to get like a bigger place because the place we were living was just really small. We didn't have a you know, place for the baby. And so we sell the place we're living and the housing market's crazy and we have no place to go. This is not like hyperbole. This isn't me exaggerating for stage. I was homeless for six weeks in 2021, legit. I had to just stay in someone's basement because I didn't have a place to live with me and my pregnant wife. I've never related to the Christmas story more in that moment, right? Like, like me and my pregnant wife and no place to stay, right? Like it was one of those moments where I was having a tough go at it, right? It, it, very real. And over time, that's exhausting. And I just, I learned this. I learned this to be true. Maybe some of you have experienced this is that pretending like everything is fine is doable, but it is exhausting. You can do it for a little while. You can pretend like everything's cool and normal and fine. But if you're really going through a tough time, if you're really going through a season like I was that year, at some point in time, you're just exhausted. And somebody catches you in the wrong moment and they say, hey, how's things going? And you're just like, it's terrible. Please don't ask any follow-ups, right? Like you just like, your, your fuse is just so short. You're like, I can't do this again. I can't just pretend like everything's fine. I'm struggling. And that's hard to do. And I think the reason why it's, it's hard to do is because most of us are afraid of what would happen if we were vulnerable and real. If we were just to give people the real deal of what we're carrying, if we would just give them the burdens that we're carrying all the time, like people just can't handle that, right? Like I, I can't handle that. 
if in a few minutes you guys get out a small group and we're all hanging out here eating chicken nuggets and I hit you with a, hey, how's it going? And you're like, well, buckle up, Heath. I can't carry that for all a couple hundred of you, right? Like that, that's just too much. It's, it's too much to carry for someone to be vulnerable and real all the time. It's true. And tonight, as we kick off our series on 1 John, that's exactly what we're talking about. Because if anybody understood this to be true, if anybody saw this close up, it's John. Spoiler, the guy who wrote 1 John, his name's John. He actually wrote three letters. The other two are appropriately named 2 John and 3 John. But tonight we're, we're looking at 1 John. It's the first of his letters. And, and in 1 John, we, we read this, the, the words of John, who John was one of Jesus' disciples. In fact, not only was he one of Jesus' disciples, he was one of Jesus' like, inner circle. Like Jesus had these 12 disciples, but he had like three besties, right? It was Peter, James, and John. And John was the one, he called himself the disciple who Jesus loved, which is a pretty great flex, just to be honest with you. Like I'm Jesus's favorite, right? Like it, it was like, it, he, this guy knew Jesus intimately. He saw Jesus carry people's burdens all the time. And he was like, hey, this is difficult. And so what he does is he gives us this letter of basically like, hey, if you want to get the best out of life, if you don't want to have to pretend anymore, if you don't want to be afraid of being vulnerable, I'm going to give you some practical advice. And that's what this series is all about, is we're going to give you some practical advice of how to get the, advice of how to get the best out of life, how to make the most of it. And so tonight, we're going to start right at the beginning in chapter 1. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, this is what John says. This is the message that we have heard from him, talking about Jesus, and declare to you, God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. Now, in, you'll find in this, in this letter, John has kind of a theme of like how to have the best version of life, and it's to know God. And he kind of gives us two characteristics of God that are very important. They come up, uh, you know, multiple times. And one of them is that God is love, and we'll talk about that later. And the second one is this, that God is light. And in this, I don't mean that, that this is God, right? Like, this is not what he means. He doesn't mean that, like, when you see a light, you're like, there he is, Heavenly Father, right? Like, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that just like light is true and good, and it helps you to, to see clearly that is what God is. God is true and good. In him, there is no imperfections. There is nothing wrong. He is the epitome of what is good and right and, and, and holy in this world. So he says that it, you know, God is light, and in him, there's no darkness at all. There's no flaws. There's no imperfections. There's nothing wrong. He is pure, perfect light. Now, here's what he says in the next verse. If we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. If you say that you know God, if you say that you're a follower of Jesus, if you say that you call yourself a Christian, and yet you walk in darkness, he's like, you're lying. Because God is light, and in him there is no darkness. And what he's doing is he's giving us a challenge to basically be like, hey, examine yourselves. How are you doing at this? Because this is really easy to put on a screen, read out loud, but it's really hard to actually live this out. Because what he's saying is like, you know, nobody in this room is perfect. Every single one of us has mistakes that we've made, failures, things that we're ashamed of. But he says, essentially, you're not supposed to just let that sit. Because when you have darkness in you, what we're all tempted to do when we mess up is to cover it up, is to hide it, to tell a lie, to get out of it. We're, all, we're constantly trying to, you know, basically fix ourselves. And in doing so, what we do is we create this darkness in our life. We create this, this basically this, 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 this place in our life where stuff goes that nobody else knows about. These little secrets that we just carry with us. And when people ask you how you're doing, you say, I'm fine. But inside you're like, uh, actually, I'm, I'm fighting with my best friend and uh, you know, they don't even know I'm mad. <laughs> right? like, or, or, hey, I actually have this, uh, this addiction that I don't know how to talk about. And uh, it'd be really uncomfortable for me to bring it up right here over some chicken nuggets, right? Like it's, it, what we're talking about here is that there are things that we carry that nobody sees, that nobody knows about. But here's the important part. They keep us from being close to God. And so what John does is that he basically gives us a challenge. He's like, hey, if there's darkness in you, you gotta do something about that. Because at that point in time, your relationship with God is, is broken, damaged, is weakened at best. And so what he says in, in the next verse, verse seven is this. He says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sins. What John invites us to is to not have to carry that stuff in darkness, not to have to hide the things that we've done wrong, not to try to cover up or lie or, or downplay the things that we are carrying. Because what he says is that, hey, if we're walking in the light, if we're walking with God, if we're you know, you know, following God as we're supposed to be, 
we have fellowship with not only him, but with other people who are doing the same thing. It's a lot easier to walk in light than it is to walk in darkness. Have you ever had to find your way around your house at night without turning the lights on? Like maybe you come in late and you're past curfew and you know your parents are going to be mad. So you're like, don't, you know, you, you quietly get into the house and you don't turn any lights. Don't, you know, try not to wake up the dog and you're, you're being quiet. And then like you stump your toe on like a piece of furniture or something. And you have to do that like silent scream where you're like, you know, like you have this moment where you're just, you're in pain. It's hard to navigate the darkness. And maybe it hasn't happened at your house because if you're anything like me, you get pretty good at knowing where stuff is in your house. But maybe you're at a friend's house and you're trying to do the same stunt, you know, but you don't know where all their furnitures are. Or maybe there's like, you know, they have a little brother, there's like Legos on the floor and you have that crippling experience. Like there is difficult to navigate the darkness. And what John says is like, then why are you doing it? There's a better way. Take what you keep in the darkness. Take those things that you're ashamed of. Take those things that you're tempted to hide. And he goes, bring them out into the light. It's not like God doesn't already know. He's God. He sees those things. And so he says, don't be tempted to hide. Don't be tempted to cover up. Don't be tempted to lie or, or, or to, to make it act like you have everything put together. We all know you don't. And he says, the, the beauty of what you have is that you have one another. You have other people to share that with. And you aren't defined by that failure. The last phrase here says, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came and he lived a perfect life that you and I couldn't. He died a death that he didn't deserve so that your mistakes don't have to define you. So why are you covering them up? Why are you hiding? That's the best you know, witness that you have that you know Jesus is that you're like, hey, I'm a mess, but I'm forgiven, right? Like that's, that's the best testimony that you could ever possibly have as a follower of Jesus. And so what John is inviting us to is to take what we keep in darkness and to drag it out into the light. What he's telling us to do is like, hey, what you have to do is not just be real with people because people can't always handle your realness. What you have to do is find people that you can walk with and instead be known. And I kind of summarized it with that. You know, don't just be real, be known. Have people who know what you're struggling with. Have people in your life who can help you carry your burdens. This isn't for everybody, right? Like later on, if we're all hanging out in here talking, eating chicken nuggets, did you guys know we're having chicken nuggets later? I feel like I'm trying to, you know, sell you on that. Uh, so the whole idea is that, the whole idea is that you don't have to tell everybody everything you're carrying, but you should have somebody who knows everything you're carrying. Everybody doesn't have to know everything you're dealing with, but somebody should. I've got a good friend who always says, he calls it the last 10% rule, is that there should be somebody in your life who knows you know, everything about you, the last 10%. Everything that, 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 that you're struggling with, they should know. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're struggling with somebody at home and you're like, man, I really want to you know, talk about this, but like, you know, it's, it's about my mom and I can't, can't confide in her, right? You need to have somebody to, to help carry that with you. And if you don't know who those people could be or you don't have those people in your life, the best place to find them is right here. Just look around, people you're in small group with every week. They probably already know your story. You're already probably doing life together. They probably already know all your failures anyways, whether you've told them or not. You know, confide in a small group leader. Confide in somebody who can help you carry this. So you don't have to just be real, you can be known. There's a quote that I love so much. In fact, some of you've probably heard me use it in here before because I think it's so great. And I'm gonna share it with you again tonight. So if you've heard it, I don't care. And so the idea is, is that like basically it's taking this and, and, and explaining why this is so true. It's by a, a pastor and an author, his name's Timothy Keller. And this is what he says. He says, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial, right? And you know this to be true. If, you've, if someone's ever said, oh, I just love you so much. And you're like, we just met. How do you, we just had a good first impression, right? Like you don't know me. He says, it's comforting. It feels nice. Like you're not mad about it, but it's fake. It's superficial. He says, to be known and not loved is our greatest fear. For someone to truly know you, they know everything about you, and to reject you, honestly, that's everyone in this room's greatest fear. And I'm not even talking about romantic relationships. I'm talking about any relationship. For somebody to truly know you, and you'd be like, oh, whew, that person is a hot mess express. I do not want to mess with them. That is our greatest fear, to be known fully and not loved, to be rejected. And here's what he goes on to say in the quote. He says, but to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. He says, what we need more than anything in this world is to be fully known and truly loved. 
That's something that everybody in your life can't hold. But somebody in your life should be willing to step up and do that. Somebody in your life is willing to take on that challenge of like, hey, I'll sit with you. I'll know all your junk. And I promise I won't think anything any different. Somebody can sit with you and say like, hey, I can, I can handle it. Tell me all the things you're struggling with and I'll be here with you as you work through them and as God redeems those things and, and, and helps rescue, them, rescue you from them. And essentially, you know, this isn't just like Timothy Keller, who's a smart guy. It's not just his words, but John confirms this. In the beginning of this, this chapter that we're looking at this week, in, in verse three, he says this. He says, see, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. Again, a guy in Jesus' inner circle, he's like, hey man, I've seen this play out. I've seen how this works so that you also may have fellowship with us. And fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. He says, like, basically, I've seen this work close up with Jesus. You need somebody who knows everything about you and loves you no matter what. And he, he goes on to say this in the, last, in the last verse. And we write this to, we write this to make our joy complete. He says he wants you to do this, not because it feels good, not because it's fun, not because it's easy, but because it's the best version of life that you can have so that our joy may be complete. So that somebody knows you and loves you no matter what, that is the most like God you may ever be for somebody, is to see them in all their failures, all their mistakes, and say, hey, you're a mess, <laughs> but I love you anyways. Because ultimately, that's what God has done for each and every one of us. He sees you, he sees your failures, he sees your mistakes, he sees that addiction that you kind of keep hidden. He sees that relationship that's broken and needs to be mended. He sees all the broken, all the things that you have in your life that aren't going great. God sees it. And he loves you completely, no matter what. The best thing that we can do is to try to be that for someone else. So your challenge tonight, every single one of you, is this. is to take one step towards the light. Take one step towards walking with God in such a way that that's how you treat someone in your life, that you have someone that, that carries your burdens and that you carry theirs, that they, that they see you and know you fully and love you anyways, and you do the same for them. And so, some ways that you can do that is, is to take some practical you know, steps to it. It's number one, step out of the darkness. You're gonna have to tell somebody all your junk. You're gonna have to take all the stuff that you keep hidden, those little things that nobody else knows about you, and you're gonna have to drag that stuff out into the light. And you'll find that when you do that, it lets go of some of the power that stuff has over your heart. Maybe for some of you, you you've done this, but what you need to do is, is the second one is to be real with God. Just be like, hey God, uh, I know that you know I'm struggling with this, but I just need you to send me somebody. I, don't, I look around and I don't know who in my life can carry my burdens. I don't know who can fully know me and truly love me. Like, God, God I need you to send me somebody. And you'll be amazed that just at that time, you know, you'll have a small group leader that says, hey, can we get coffee this week? Or that friend from I.O. is like, hey, we should get together and, and talk about what we talked about on, on Sunday. Like you, you'll find, it's like, hey, God, I, I want to deal with this. I need you to help me. I need you to send someone to help me wrestle with this. And maybe for some of you, you just need to be that person. And that's what number three is, is to help others feel more known. To be the kind of person that can handle somebody else's stuff and love them in spite of it. And so I.O., your challenge tonight is just this, is don't just be real, be known. I kicked this thing off this, tonight and I was kind of telling you guys about like, hey, I think this is so cool how uh, ironically, I think that, that God has just kind of have a word for our church today. You know, over the weekend at Transit Weekend, I challenged them like, hey, don't, don't do middle school by yourself. Like you're gonna struggle. Middle school's hard. You guys all remember how hard middle school can be. I was like, don't do it by yourself. You need somebody to do it with you. And obviously I want you to know Jesus, but if you're not ready for that, lean into your small group, right? I kind of told him that. And then I sit through Adam's message this morning and Adam's whole message was about like, hey, two are better than one. Find somebody that, that can do life with you and, and, and they can basically carry all of your burdens. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I'm talking about tonight is that, hey, I want you to find somebody that you can be real with and that they can know you and love you. And I just feel like tonight, God is inviting you inside out. God is inviting you, Brownsbridge Church. God is inviting you small group leaders in the room. We're all carrying something. Every single one of us walked in this room tonight with life happening all around us. The invitation this week is not, not do life by yourself. Don't keep things hidden in darkness. Instead, bring that stuff to the light and you'll be amazed to see all that God does in 
and through you. I would love to pray for you guys, and then I have an announcement before you guys go talk about this a bit more in your groups. So if you will, bow your heads and pray with me. God, how cool is it that we didn't plan this, I didn't even mean for this to happen, but middle school students are hearing that, they, that we need each other. High school students are hearing that we need each other. Our adult congregation is hearing, hey, we need each other. And God, we here tonight hear you. We got it. We need each other. So God, my prayer tonight is for boldness and bravery to not just hear it, but to do it. Not just hear it, but to live it out. And so God, as these students break off and they go into their small groups, God, that you would give them a boldness to say, hey, I need this in my life. I don't have anybody like this in my life. Hey, can somebody in here help me out and be that person for me? And God, in doing so, I pray that all of us would draw closer to the light, that we would draw closer to you, our Heavenly Father, and that our joy would be made complete as we draw closer to you together. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.